Psalm 149. This one, this one could be a difficult one, depending on how you take it, read it, and understand it. So I think it's worth us looking at tonight. Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly exalt in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written, this is honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. So that's Psalm 149. Um, the headline that I have on, uh, on my Bible for this one is a victory song. It's, uh, it's like a celebration of, of victory. Um, but uh, it can strike modern ears wrong. And uh, maybe, you, maybe you caught some of that there. In verse 6, it says, Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. It's like we're praising while we are taking our swords. And then it says, To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples. So it's not like we can say, Well, we're just carrying the swords. We're not using them. No, it, it, it kind of says we're using them too. So this is kind of... It's kind of difficult. It sounds like holy war almost. God is on our side and we're using Him as an excuse to, to get rid of our enemies. And it's true. This psalm has been misused as a battle song in religious wars. When I was studying for this, I came across this. That uh, there was uh, a guy who, who, during the Thirty Years' War, which was you know, at least started as a religious war, um, people were using this to recruit uh, princes to fight in these wars. And uh, during the Reformation times, it was used by a group of the Anabaptists to uh, start a revolt as well. So, we need to understand this psalm appropriately, and not just for you know, whatever political ends we might have at this time and place. Um, it's been misused in the past, so we need to understand it properly. And we can't just say, well, it's the Old Testament, so it doesn't matter. We can't do that. The whole Old Testament points to Christ and tells us about Him, and uh, we need to understand what this is saying. So verse 1, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of the godly, it says. This is a song for the godly. Only for the godly, actually. This is, this is for God's people gathered together. This is a song for them to sing. This is not just for, for you know, everybody anywhere. This is for okay those who are, are saved by grace, those who are gathered in the name of the Lord. That's, this is for them. So this is for a specific people, God's covenant people particularly. And number f- or verse 4. This is another part that is important for us to pay attention to also. Verse 4 again, For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He adorns the humble with salvation. The humble. Okay? This is a song of the humble. These are for, this song is for humble believers to sing. Not just anybody anywhere. This is for humble believers to sing. So in the mouths of powerful people, this could be used to say, hey, let's go get the bad guys and let's rid, them earth of, rid the earth of them and get rid of them. You know, if we were powerful, then it would be a bad song or it could motivate some bad selfish motives. But if you are weak and singing this song, then you can't exercise any vengeance or justice on your enemies at all. 
And this song then becomes putting your trust in the Lord for His justice to come. It changes the whole, the whole trajectory of it and the whole motivations behind it. And it's worth noting that, okay, the Israelites were the ones who sang this song first originally. For most of its history, Israel was the humble underdog of all the nations of the time. They were, they were this, I mean, with, with the exception maybe of the time of David and Solomon, Israel was not exactly a powerhouse of military might. It was not like the other nations that were around at that time. The Egypts, the Assyrias, the Babylons, and those kinds of nations. Israel was constantly, or had to constantly be concerned about being attacked and being overrun, being conquered, deported, and so forth. And just, just even more broadly, Israel was never really known for its its uh, advances in science or technology or anything like that. Even the Hebrew alphabet that we have today didn't originate from them. It's, uh, the Hebrew alphabet that we have today is actually Aramaic letters. So every, everything, that, everything that they had and they, they used culturally as well as militarily, they had to depend on somebody else for it. These were not the, the big kids on the block. They were the humble one who was always the underdog. And they were conquered and subjugated many times. Many times during the days of the judges, then um, in the days of the kings by Egypt and Babylon and Assyria, Persia, Greece, and then Rome up until the time Jesus was born. Likewise, for all believers of all times, For God's people at any time, the true faith was expected to vanish long ago. Many times in history, the true faith in the true God was supposed to just disappear. It was considered outdated, irrelevant, and ridiculous. This is going to go away. And this has been happening forever. So back in 350, there was a Roman emperor who died, and the one who took over was uh, a guy who, who held to a certain kind of heresy where he believed that Jesus wasn't God. He didn't, he re- there was a rejection of the Trinity. Jesus wasn't God. He was a creature. And so we can't worship Him or anything like that. And the people, one writer said, at that point the whole world woke up and discovered that it had become Arian. True faith was going to die. What ended up happening is that emperor just died very unexpectedly, and then the true faith had a resurgence. In 1822, Thomas Jefferson said, you know what, there's nobody alive today in this country who's not going to die a Unitarian. He was convinced that Unitarianism was the way to go. Unitarianism basically means that there's no three persons the Father, Son, and the Spirit are, are basically just one person going in different forms. And that's, that's not what we believe. We believe in three persons. Thomas Jefferson thought, no, one God and three persons, that doesn't make sense. Unitarianism is going to triumph. And in some of your memories, how many of you remember the cover of Time Magazine reading, Is God Dead? Anybody remember that? A couple people? All right. Christianity, the true faith, is supposed to die, disappear, be irrelevant. It's supposed to be gone a long time ago. It never has. It's still around, and especially on a worldwide scale, it's still growing very rapidly. Maybe not in our country as much anymore, but around the world, Christianity is spreading faster than they can train leaders to lead people. Okay, verse 4, one more thing about that. God gives salvation and victory to His humble people. The, the word that we have there with, that says salvation can, is kind of a broad word. It can be victory as well. So whatever, whatever you're, you're faced with, 
whether it's guilt of sins or just an opponent who's, who's going to destroy you or whatever, God gives us salvation and deliverance and victory. And He does this to the humble. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's a recurring theme throughout the Bible. Humility is a virtue. God values the humble and looks on the humble. And then verse 6 is kind of where it gets, it gets a little, little violent. Or it starts to. Verse 6 connects praising God to brandishing swords. So we praise, we praise God and we, we hold up our swords and these, these go together. And that, that just kind of hits us weird. One of my, one of my favorite uh, commentaries even said this, I do not know what to make of this, for it is quite unexpected in these hymns. I find this psalm very difficult to interpret precisely because the proposed action could have very different intentions. So, this is, this is difficult. How do, we, how do we make sense of this? And even more difficult than verse 6 is verse 7, even, where verse 7 specifies the sword is used for vengeance. You know? Whereas God has said many other t- places and times, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. And then here it says that, that God's people are going to do the vengeance. So, let, you know, how do we make sense of this? You know, if verse 7 wasn't there, we could say, yeah, we're just going to hang on to the sword, we're not going to use it, but then verse 7 comes along, it's like, okay, now we're using the swords, and we're not only just using them, we're using them to, for vengeance, which is something only God's supposed to do. Okay. But verse 8, I think, shed some light on this a little bit. It says, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. Kind of the the object of this are the kings and the nobles. And for the, I said subjected, for the subjected Israelites, the captors would be the captives. So this is kind of the imagery that they are going off of here. The people who have conquered us, defeated us, made us prisoners in our own time and place, these people, they are going to be the ones under captive. They are going to be ones in prison, in chains. The tables are going to be turned. And as a humbled people, this is kind of their song of hope. It's a song of hope. They're they are currently themselves defeated, subjugated, but they are looking forward to the time when these tables will be turned. So it's a little bit different than, than what it might seem, at least on the surface. This is a promise of hope for a humbled nation. Except, in all of Israel's history, they never actually shackled their captors, ever. They never actually did that. They, they won a lot of victories. They were liberated from Egypt, and, and uh, there were other times when they won a victory over their, their captors, but they never actually put shackles on the people that were in sha- uh, enslaving them. So this is talking about something else. This is... This is a bigger picture for something. For God's people of all time, us and them alike, we will triumph over the spiritual powers. That's where this ultimately gets its fulfillment. We triumph over the spiritual powers. Earthly powers are flashes in a pan. They're here for a while. They're gone soon afterwards. I couldn't help but notice how Ephesians 6.12, which is up there, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities. Let's just stop there for a minute. It says here, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. We're talking about rulers. Kings and nobles are pretty, pretty uh, congruent with 
Uh, let's see, rulers and authorities. There's a connection there. There's, there's some similarities there. And this is the this part here, Ephesians 6, this right after this is when it goes into the armor of God. And it talks about this. This is how we fight against these cosmic powers. So we triumph with God's armor. Not our own armor, not our own swords or anything like that. Guns and swords are useless against a spiritual enemy. Can you just imagine somebody just trying to shoot into the air? trying to kill some sort of spiritual power, that's ridiculous. We can't fight spiritual powers with earthly weapons. You can't. It's a waste of time. But God's armor is the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation... And since we're talking about swords here, let's highlight this part of the armor. Our sword is of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's what our sword is. When it's talking about the sword here, it finds its ultimate fulfillment in the Holy Spirit and God's Word. The sword of the Spirit, which is... The Word of God, as it says in Ephesians 6. I don't think this is a coincidence. When God put His Word together for us to read, He's he's designing these connections intentionally. This song is about triumphing over spiritual powers. And this sword in particular is about using the Holy Spirit and God's Word against those powers. And as I was sitting here thinking about this, thinking about, okay, we have, we have God's Word, which is like a sword, and we have the Holy Spirit that equips us to understand it and to use it. Um, I mean, technically, uh, the Holy Spirit is, is what makes the truths of God real and relevant to all of us. But when we are against these spiritual forces... There's some big stuff going on that I don't think we fully realize or appreciate. So I just kind of had this, I just kind of had this notion of we have we have these spiritual powers here, these ugly spiritual demons that are attacking us, that want us to sin, that want us to turn away from God, that want us to put our trust in something else. And they like to sneak up behind you and just to go after those weak spots in in your armor or whatever. Satan knows our weaknesses probably better than we even know them. But we slay unseen dragons each time we obey God instead of our impulses. There's There's some real spiritual warfare going on when we are wanting to act, let's say, on our anger, and instead we think of what God has said, and we say, you know what, I'm going to trust God instead. I'm not going not to react angrily. A dragon just got slayed by that. That is not human to do that. When somebody seriously hurts you or seriously offends you, and you decide, you know what, I'm not going to do that because of what God has said. Some demon just hit the ground by the sword that is the Spirit and God's Word to us. These spiritual forces are stronger than us in every way. Were it not for God's help and God's armor, we would be toast. We would be played like a fiddle at these powers, but because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, we can defeat them. The Spirit and the Word are powerful to defeat all kinds of enemies. I just got a few here. Fear, despair, pride, lust, and you can go on. Greed, hate, sloth, gluttony, whatever the case may be. The Spirit and the Word are powerful to defeat these things. 
These things that without the Spirit and the Word, we would never defeat. These things would rule us and dominate us if it were not for the Lord in our lives. If you want to try to imagine what your life would be like without Jesus, think of all of those sins and think of them ruling your life. That would be us without Jesus. These are powerful. The Holy Spirit is our connection to Christ at God's right hand. We have power at our disposal that we barely even realize, I think. And the Holy Spirit is our anointing also so that we share in Christ all of His power and victory. And God's Word is the truth that sets us free. And it cuts through all kinds of deception and lies that are used to get us to go the wrong way. Let's uh, look at this. Let's answer this together. But why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in His anointing. I am anointed to confess His name, to present myself to Him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. There's power here that we have in Christ through the Holy Spirit. And whenever you tap into this power, giants are slain. And maybe we don't think about it that way very often, but that's exactly what's going on here. We are at a spiritual war, and there are enemies around us that want us to put our trust in other things and to disregard what God says. And there is power to defeat them. And every time that they are defeated, all of those defeats, their defeats are foretelling their final defeat. Every time that they hit the ground defeated, that is just another indication and a sign to them and to us that they have just a limited time. They are ultimately going to be defeated, eliminated, destroyed, and they will never bother us again. They are on bowered time. It's only a short time. Uh, one of Jesus' parables, he talks about weeds among the wheat. And he said, when, when he comes back, he says, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin in all who do evil. They're going to be plucked out. And he says, then they're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. All of these spiritual forces will be ultimately defeated forever. Verse 9, it talks about to execute on them the judgment written. Every time we slay those dragons, this is part of that judgment. We're foretelling it, foreshadowing it. Um, but then it says, this is honor for all of his godly ones. This is, this is our honor. It's our honor to slay these dragons and to bring down these giants. Satan cannot control us. He cannot defeat us. We knock these guys down. It's our honor to defeat these vicious enemies. And they are vicious. If they had their way, they would engulf us with all of their temptations and all of their despair and shame and we would be their slaves. They are vicious. So don't ever underestimate them. But because of what we have in Jesus, we can defeat them. And when we do, it's our honor. It's an honor to be a part of God's victory in this world. And we can walk forward with confidence when this happens. But then the last line... Praise the Lord. This is not for our praise. Our victories are for the praise of God. 
these, these victories against these spiritual forces. This is not so we can think all so much highly of ourselves. This is so that we can recognize that God's power is at work within us. It's not, it's not my power, it's His. It's not yours, it's His. And so we praise Him because of all of this. It's our honor, we can feel good about it, for sure. But the honor goes to Him. The misuse of this psalm is still being mentioned by atheists to this day. When we misuse God's word for our own ends, as it says in the Bible, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. When we use it for our ends, God's name is blasphemed. When we use God's word for his ends to defeat his enemies, then it results in praise of him. And in Christ, the end is sure and certain. And so we praise now. This is why we gather every Sunday. Because we can praise the Lord. No matter whether we had a good week or a bad week, whether things are going well or not so well, even if we're in the midst of defeat and sadness, we can still praise because that end is sure. As it says in Romans 16.20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. We can rejoice, we can be glad because of what Jesus has already done and will finish doing. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray together. O Lord, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you praise for what you have done with us, what you are doing through us, and what you will do. And Lord, we pray that we would We would slay the giants that come our way, not by our own power, but by your word and spirit. And that, Lord, this would be our our honor, but it would also be your glory and to your praise. In the name of Jesus, amen.